Yeah. Good evening, guys, and welcome to another edition of Harry's Half Hour. This is episode nine. And joining me this evening is a broadcasting titan of the sport, the legend that is Mr. John Gwynn. Good evening, John. Yeah. Uh, did you say John Glynn? Gwynn. I was going to say, oh, sorry, you better start again. I thought you it's said all right. I can just edit that bit out if needs be. Um, but how are you anyway, John? How have you been keeping? Well, I think most people know that I'm having a, a torrid time at the moment. I was diagnosed, and it's an awful uh, subject to start the interview on, but that's what life is. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, cancer in November, and indeed, I undergo a period of uh, uh, a program, I should say, of uh, treatment at the Christie Hospital in Manchester through Jan through February, March, and uh, April. So, the answer to your question is, uh, Harry, I've not been very well. I'm not going to be very well for the next few weeks, but I hope at the end of it all that I'm fighting fit again and raring to go. Good, that's what we want to hear, want to keep, keep, see you keep fighting. Um, obviously, you've been a broadcasting giant within the sport of darts for many, many years, but it's, is it right that you were a teacher beforehand? Yes, and um, I, I'm not exclusive to darts. Um, I've other sports that I take a great interest in football and cricket in particular and uh, I would say that my broadcasting career has largely been divided into three with um, darts obviously playing a significant part and obviously that's what we're largely going to talk about uh, but I was a cricket commentator for many many years covering Lancashire and I've been a football commentator for many years too um, uh, covering Oldham Athletic when they're in their glory days, 30 years ago now. And um, uh, I've been tw over 20 years on Soccer Saturday for Sky Sports. And um, so, yes, and I've done Rugby League as well. I've done quite a bit of Rugby League. So uh, darts is just um, one of the sports that I've uh, been involved in, Harry. And obviously, uh, at a very important time, for the uh, sport of darts because uh, we, we were the first commentators on satellite television when it first came on to Sky Sports in the early 90s. So was the uh, early 90s then your first World Championships, I believe, was it the 92 or 93? Was that when the first PDC World Championships? Yes, the, the first ever World Championship uh, at the Circus Tavern was uh, started on December the 27th, 1993. And it was the 1994 WDC World Championship. Obviously, the BDO World Championship, the Embassy, was still going on uh, over at Frimley Green. And indeed, I was involved in that as well. Uh, I was covering that event for BBC Radio. So in the early years of the PDC event, I was covering both events because they, they didn't clash with each other other than on the one weekend. The last weekend of one happened to be the first weekend of the other. Um, but yes, for quite a number of years, I was covering both events for Sky Sports uh, with Dave Lanning initially and then with Dave and Sid, La uh, Sid Waddell uh, latterly. Um, and uh, and I was travelling across to Frimley Green once the PDC tournament was over to cover the embassy. So I had the best of both worlds, really. Yeah. But it's true, I was a school teacher originally and gave up teaching in 1987 after 20 years uh, in the classroom. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And think back now uh, to those days with, with great... Um, with great pleasure and uh, happy memories. Obviously, you retired from commentary in 2013, um, but you continued for a few years after that, working with the BDO. I remember you've been, uh, I think it was, I was watching a clip the other day, it was the Well Masters girls with Burgreaves and um, 
the Russian, the young Russian girl, um, and was that something you sort of planned to do after retiring from the PDC, or did you sort of just fall into it? No, uh, the circumstances of my leaving the sky uh, was, uh, and it wasn't the PDC I left, uh, I was employed by Sky Sports, uh, was that uh, Dave Lanning had retired, Sid Waddell had been taken ill and was seriously ill, and um, Wayne Mardle and Rod Studd were suddenly the new boys on the block, and uh, I felt as though I'd been um, uh, marginalised. I know Wayne would laugh at this if I say marginalised. Uh, but uh, we're good friends, Wayne and I, and so are Rod Studd and I. Uh, but um, I, I did become somewhat marginalised. I was left out of tournaments like the World Cup. I didn't do two successive World Cups. And from being... Uh, one of the leading lights I was made to feel, and I was made to feel, very much a support act, and uh, and I decided it was making me ill. I was, uh, I was not an easy person to live with at that time, though I think generally I like to think that I am. And I made the decision to retire at the age of 68, but I didn't really want to stop commentating on darts. Um, and I do regret not asking Sky if I could just have a six month uh, or a 12 month uh, sabbatical and then review the situation and see if I'd like to come back and resume my career. I think that would have been a more sensible thing to do. But I've not always done sensible things in my life at times. Uh, I've sort of taken the wrong path and um, I think I did on this occasion. I think I, I would always now, I would now love to go back as a support act and just do a couple of weeks, 20 days, 15, 20 days work in a year. I'm, I'm make no secret of that. Of course, I've got to get over this illness first and get back to full fitness. But the reason I decided to go and work on BDO projects was that I was asked to. People knew that I was available, and I was asked if I'd like to go and do the Six Nations, which was the first one I did in 2014 in Glenrothes in uh, Fife, um, and uh, various other. I did the, the the World Darts Trophy, I think, three or four years running. We did uh, and the British Open in Bridlington. I've done quite a number of BDO events, and in fact, I did the BDO World Championship, the very last one. I don't think there'll be another one. The very last one at the O2 last uh, year, Wayne Warren won it. And yeah. I was working with Paul Nicholson and uh, John Rawling and uh, Tony O'Shea. We had a good time. So I never wanted to give up darts commentary. And the way I went about it, it now when I look back, I think uh, I, I did it all wrongly. But um, I, I, it would have been better if I'd have taken a month, uh, a few months off, and then maybe gone back and uh, and and, and re-establish myself. But there we are. You can't turn the clock back. I mean, obviously, you've 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 had a an amazing, a stellar career in the sport of darts, and it must be so hard to pick certain games. But if you had sort of five games, maybe you could pick out as your favourites to comment on? Is there any five that stick in your mind? It's, it's harder to uh, think of five than it is to think of two or three because uh, there are always the odd ones that stand out, remarkably stand out, and they're usually in the later stages of the competition. The obvious one is the 2007 final, the very last darts thrown at the Circus Tavern. We'd been there since 1994, so 13, 14 years. And um, Barney and Taylor was obviously the game of all games. And uh, the scenario was that Barney was new to the PDC. He'd come over the previous spring 
and every single match between Barney and Taylor at the time, whether it was in the Premier League, whether it was in the uh, UK Open, and they met in the quarterfinals of that, uh, whatever the competition, it was always the main event. And uh, when it actually was the World Championship final, uh, then obviously, and the kind of game it turned out to be uh, meant that uh, that has to be the standout game. I think the standout game for everybody everywhere involved in darts. Uh, I don't think you will ever get to the stage where Barney is three sets to nil down. He's not even hit a 180 and uh, it, he looks as though he's shot his bolt. And we all thought, well, this is going to be an early night. And then he came back and took the game the distance. He hit 21 180s in the end and took that game the distance and in the end to a sudden death decider. And the, even that had all the drama of uh, one leg, had all the drama of, uh, of, of, of a full match because Taylor hit the 25. Uh, Barney asked for the dart to be left in. He hit the 50, and I remember saying that will be the most important ball that Barnevelt has hit in his entire career because it meant he had to throw in the sudden death. Now, the second visit of the sudden death, Taylor hit a 180, so he, if in effect, eroded that advantage that Barney had had. But what does Barney do? He hits back straight away with a 180 of his own. And I remember saying, uh, when the first one uh, went in, I went, that's inviting another one, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? And it did, of course. And Barney hit a 180 as well. Uh, it was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And to be sharing that with Sid was, was obviously the highlight of my career uh, as a darts commentator and indeed as a sports commentator. And I've... I've done uh, seven or eight Lords finals, cricket finals. I've done many, many big football matches and rugby league matches. But I think that would stand out. Another game which stands out, and again, it's because of the personnel as much as anything, although they put on a fantastic performance, was the 1997 semi-final between Phil Taylor and um, Eric Bristow. And Eric Bristow turned the clock back to his pre uh Dartitis days in that year and threw magnificently and had the really had the chance in that semi final to beat Taylor. Uh, I think he lost 6 4 in the end. Had he made it five apiece by hitting double eight, Bristol said to me, I had him. He was gone. He was gone. I knew if I'd have hit that double eight, I'd have won. He said, I know that Taylor was gone. He said, but missing that double eight, I let him out, I let him off. Um, I think even Phil Taylor probably would admit that. That was another game. There are so many others. I mean, yeah. uh, one I remember in particular was, um, oh, um, the Nine Darters, the one where the Nine Darters come up. The one where Michael Van Gerwen, I've got to put that in, where he hit... <laughs> A nine darter, and I was commentating with Stuart Pike. Stuart called in the nine darter. Uh, he got, uh, he left himself 144, and he got treble 20, treble 20, double 12. And uh, then he kicks off with 180. Of course. He kicks off with 180, and uh, then it's my turn to call it in. He gets the treble 20, he gets the treble 19, and he wants the double 12. Oh, I do not believe people say, what would you have said if that had gone in? And I said, I probably would have lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> I remember actually that match. I remember because... watching that semi-final, and I remember your commentary after the first one. And I know it was, it was you saying, you went, Blackpool in July. London in December, oh. Van Gerwen does it again, and then I think it was uh, uh, Stuart Pike, and here he goes again. Oh, it's yes. just moments like yeah. that. Thought what? Well, out in your mind. 
So I've mentioned three there. Uh, another one I like was Dean Wynn Stanley's 11 data. I think that was in 2011. So I've, this is the fourth. Um, although it's not necessarily in order, this would be number five in my list. Um, and I love the I love the uh, nine data of Wayne of uh, uh, of Dean, the way that he responded to it and everything. Real character. I'm I'm sorry that his career ended fairly abruptly. Really, he lost his form, and uh, it's hard to retrieve it. But um, that was a member. But but obviously the one that comes in as well. I think at number four would be the history maker. Uh, that was in 2011 in uh, uh, the, at the um, so, sorry in Ireland at the uh, City West and, yeah, uh, yeah, James Wade and, uh, and uh, Brendan Dolan yeah. Brendan actually that week that week he slowed his action down now more recently he's been speeding up again but he slowed his act, he became so deliberate and it served him well. He threw magnificently. And to be the first man to do the nine data in that competition uh, was uh, on, on Irish soil was brilliant. I know he's from Northern Ireland, but only just. He, crossed, he crosses the river and he's in the Republic from where he lives. And in fact, he told me that he plays his league darts he plays his darts across the river which uh, separates uh, northern ireland from the republic of ireland county fermanagh from county cavern and uh, he, he he played his darts in the republic uh, for, for brendan to do that was brilliant and there's another one i've got to uh, mention uh, it's it's more because the time when in the same competition, but it was at Rochester in Kent before we moved to Ireland. It was in 1999 and uh, Phil Taylor was going for the nine data. He did the 160 start, he got a 180 and since going berserk, he got the treble 20. He wants a treble 17, he wants a treble 17. Since going absolutely berserk and Phil can hear him because we're actually quite close to the stage. So, so Phil stands back and Sid's can't see him. And I'm saying, and I very quietly have to say, he can hear you, Sid. He can <laughs> hear you. Well, Sid dropped his mic. He looked up. He dropped his mic. He went, he went back on his, fell back off his chair. And I had to take up the commentary, a la Ted Lowe, the snooker commentator. So Taylor wants the treble 17. And we have to remember, Taylor, Taylor still wanted the treble 17. So Taylor, Taylor wants the treble 17. And he got it. Now he wants the bull. He wants the bull's eye for a nine dart. And he hit the 25. Now Sid was distraught. He thought that he had denied or played a major part in denying Phil Taylor the nine dart. And Phil quite rightly and so magnanimously uh, said to Sid afterwards, look Sid, I hit the treble 17. When you, when you were shouting I needed the treble 17, I hit that. I got the treble 17. He said, I missed the bull. You didn't miss it for me. And any, uh, John Gwynn didn't miss it for me. He said, I missed the bull. That's the end of the matter. But I never forget that. And, and Sky, whenever they show that, they, they've they edited out a little bit when I say he can hear you, Sid. They've edited that out, edited, and I think that's rather a pity, really. But it's, um, it adds the drama to the occasion as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and maybe, really, I should have just dropped my mic and just tapped Sid and pointed. But um, I think it adds to it. And uh, anyway. That was another one. So I suppose those games stand out. There are lots and lots of other moments, but um, I suppose those games stand out really, yes. It was a, another one as well I remember was the uh, Premier League finals night. It was Simon Whitlock and Andy Hamilton. And I remember yourself and I think it was Rod Studd was on commentary with you. And it was the, uh, 
uh, Whitlock in the first leg hadn't hit a treble 20. And then in the second, yeah. it was 180. Obviously, Hamilton starts with a 180. And then I think it's Rod Studd goes, could we? Could we? And then Hamilton oh, yeah. the single 20. Oh, yeah. And then you follow on with Whitlock. Could we? Could he hit the tre- yeah. And he hit the nine data. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. Well, sometimes in commentary, you know, uh, the least you say, the better. It's what you say. Um, I very rarely, well, I don't. I don't. I have my thoughts about commentators and who I like and who I'm not particularly fond of as a commentator. I like them all as people. And I don't think there's a bad one, a really bad one amongst them. But uh, there are some I prefer to others. There are some that... I think talk too much sometimes and I think you've got to let the commentary breathe and the moments of silence are often as important as the moments of of high uh, voltage and verbiage but um, yeah uh, there are times when the commentary demands a lot of animation and vociferous uh, indulgence and there are times when it demands a quiet voice and sometimes just total silence. Um, my favourite sports commentator, I think I'm right in saying, is probably Richie Benno, the famous cricket commentator, because he just he said absolutely everything that needed to be said, no more, no less. And uh, morning. That was it. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I've, had, I've had some great times, some great moments. I've had some bad matches. We all do. I've had matches where I've come out and I've thought I was rubbish there uh, and made mistakes. But uh, not pretending for a minute that I was perfect or uh, better than anybody else. But I was, I, I like to put my personality into it, my character, and uh, I was always aware of the audience. And it was always, it was not, I didn't know, I don't know whether it was male or female, but it's somebody sitting on the settee at home watching it. I don't know, I can't, don't know even what they look like, but I know what they're thinking whilst that game is on. And I'm responding to that. It's amazing. I'm always conscious of that. And, um, and, and that goes for any sport that I commentate on. Um, but um, yes, and also, of course, you, you're aware of your colleague. You, you bounce off your colleague. Um, Sid used to amuse me because he'd say, John, we're not supposed to cr- cross each other. We've got to stop cutting across each other. Finno told us we've got to stop cutting across each other. He, that was Andy Finn, one of the producers, production team. So I'd do my earnest, I'd do my best to try and stop. And I'd start talking, Sid, Sid would cut across. Sid, you couldn't discipline him. Nor would you want to. Nor would you want to. Because he was what he was because of that. Because something came to his mind and he had to say it. So, uh, but he wasn't always willing to accept, to accept, I don't think he realised he was cutting across, but I'd start to say something, I'd be halfway through it and suddenly jump in. And then we did fall out over it, I remember at uh, Bognor Regis in the uh, World Pairs in 97. And I said, Sid, Sid, with the greatest of respect, you're the one that's jumping in on me, not me on you. And, um, and uh, we, 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 it caused a little bit of friction. But I think in all the years we worked together, 17 years, and I've known him before then, when he worked at the BBC, we were always, we were always good friends. Um, Dave, somebody I admired as well, obviously, because yeah. he'd been around for donkey's years. And, and people forget, the first PDC darts, or WDC darts on television, wasn't Sky. It was in the regions, uh, recorded highlights, admittedly, it wasn't live, but we did in 92, September 92, we did the very first one in East Anglia for Anglia Television, and it was in Norwich. And that was recorded and shown 
as a half hour program or an hour long program in midweek. Um, we did one in Yorkshire, I remember for Yorkshire television, three years running. And we did one two, three years running up in the Northeast in Newcastle for Time Teach television. So we did quite a number and, and it was uh, Dave Lanning and I who did those. And I, I, this is something I like to put right. I was the MC because it was recorded. I was the MC. So when people say how many MCs of the PDC are, oh, Phil Jones and John MacDonald. Well, the answer is no. When we used to do those uh, ones for Yorkshire Television and uh, Time Tees and uh, Anglia, uh, and I said we did about nine or ten over a three year period, I would do the MC, and ladies and they weren't massive audiences, but nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, now welcome our next two combatants, and first of all, and so on and so on. And first, and he'd walk up to, up to the stage. And then the next one, he'd walk up to the stage. And then I'd just put my mic down and go to the, go to the commentary box, which was, not, sometimes it was at the back of the room, sometimes it was just a few yards away. And so, always remember this, folks. The, the WDC or the PDC have had three MCs. John Gwynn who was never actually seen on stage, uh, Phil Jones and John MacDonald. Uh, and I know others have stood in. I think um, Dan Dawson has stood in, hasn't he, recently, uh, with great effect. And I know Russ Spray has done it. But I'm talking about on a sort of permanent basis, if you can call nine or ten shows permanent. But uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't make a major issue of that, but it does take me back to those very early days in the early 90s when the split took place and I could talk about the schism and the split. When I write my book, it will take up a good two chapters because I was at Frimley Green in 89 when they dropped the British Professional Championship and that meant that from having something like eight, ten, or even a dozen darts events on telly, on ITV and BBC, it was before satellite television, it had gone down to one, the Embassy World Championship. And the players had become almost redundant. Their exhibitions uh, were dropping off. The manufacturers were suffering because obviously darts wasn't being portrayed like snooker was as, as often on television and everybody was losing out and nobody wanted to split to break away those manufacturers managers agents players all they wanted the BDO to do was take on a PR company to run that side of the spool. The BDO would run the competitions and they would have nothing to do with the competitions, the PR company, but the BDO dug their heels in and would not move. And that's why the WDC, which became the PDC, was formed. And I lived through all that because I was going from, I was going, I saw all that happen between 1989 and 1993. And then when I started commentating on Sky, in, at the end of 93, I was traveling from one world championship to the other. And you can imagine the reception I got from some of them at the BDO one. Oh, you're your WDC I said no last week I was SKY this week I'm BBC so put that in your PIPE and smoke it and but a lot of people a lot of people didn't didn't like didn't like the idea of me being uh, in the BDO one working I was a working journalist and I covered that event for BBC radio what is now five live well, it became Five Live in about 94, 95 anyway. I was working for them 10 years running. 
great doing these reports live into sports report and very and other sporting events in the middle of a football match alan green would say we're going over for the latest at frimley green on the darts you know and i'd do a quick 30 seconds into the middle of a football match it was great it was great to be part of that and um uh, so i had every right to be at frimley green uh, as indeed i had of course to be at the circus tavern so in that sense i was unique and therefore i was um, i've got a few tales to tell i can tell you and uh, perhaps my book ought to come along uh, sooner rather than later particularly with this illness because you never know how long you've got to last do you no nah. Um, obviously, you were saying about other sports, cricket. Have you been watching the England Sri Lanka test? Oh, yes. That's been a great relief to me to be able to get up in the middle of the night. Well, four o'clock in the morning. Not always. What I'd do, actually, play would start at 4.30. And then lunch would be at 6.30, our time. So I'd come to bed, 40 minutes, I wasn't going to sit up with Then I'd have, I'd have another couple of hours sleep, and then I'd go down and watch the rest of the morning. And um, I've all, I also watched much of the Australia-India series. Now, I'd watch that. That would start at sort of 11 o'clock at night, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning there. And, uh, and then I'd watch it till lunch, which would probably be one o'clock in the morning and then come to bed um, and if if I couldn't sleep in the night or I woke up in the night and couldn't get back to sleep I'd go down and watch Australia and India and the last test was absolutely amazing I mean India set 320 odd to win and the highest total that had been scored on that ground that's at Brisbane uh, uh, by a test team to win a match was 220 odd to get 320 odd was amazing. It was a, it was an amazing performance. So yes, I like my cricket. And uh, uh, in 2019, I did the PA for Lancashire for the home games at Old Trafford, the Jack Championship and the 50 over competition. I didn't do the T20. That's all razzmatazz and DJs and fireworks and what have you. But um, I was furloughed in 2020 because of the COVID. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I love my cricket and football. I've had some great times as well, great moments. In fact, I've written a book called Soccer Satisfied. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it is a football book, but it's also really about my life from beginning as a poor, proud Salopian. I was a Shropshire lad born by birth, born in Shrewsbury. Moved to Manchester when I was 12, became a Man City fan when really I wanted to be a United fan, but my pal from school took me to Main Road and City beat Portsmouth and that was it. That was back in 1957. So I've had some pretty rough times, I'll tell you, over the years. John, I would but love to stay and chat with you all night. I just love listening to you talk. You've got so many tales and so many stories, yeah. but we are running out of time. Thank you oh, right. so much for coming on and all the best and I wish you all the all the best in your health and in all your treatment. And don't forget the book, folks. It's called Soccer Satisfied. Amazon. You get it on there. It's quite cheap and it's well worth reading. Well worth reading, even though I say it myself. I'll pop a link in the description so you can go and purchase John's yeah. book. If you guys have liked what you've seen, hit the like button and hit that subscribe button. Again, John, thank you very much for coming on and I wish you the best of luck in your treatment. Cheers, Harry. Thank you, mate. All Pleasure. the best. Thank you.